I would like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. If you'll have your Bible open. In the book of 1 Samuel to chapter 31, we'll begin with verse 1. I had plans on this cold, snowy night to bring a message I hope would be used of God in preparation in the final word I'll give before we begin our faithful men's meeting. And so I'm going to do exactly what I plan to do <laughs> and pray that God will use it in a mighty way to stir our hearts about what must be done in the Lord's work in this place. If you have your Bible open to 1 Samuel chapter 31, we begin with verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchashua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hid him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. It came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this for your remembrance. In the 12th verse, verse number 12, chapter 31, 1 Samuel, all the valiant men arose. All the valiant men arose. It changed everything when all the valiant men arose. Now the battle of Israel with the Philistines was something that was rumbling for quite a while. The enemy they faced all the time, the Israelites, was the enemy of the Philistines. The Philistines would get ready for battle by gathering all their pieces to make the whole. Five princes of the Philistine cities would gather the armies they had and they would all join forces to march against their enemy. This time the enemy, of course, is Israel. And the Israelites knew it was coming. Saul knew it was coming. His three sons knew it was coming. If you remember, if you're reading through the book of 1 Samuel, you find David with his episode at Ziklag involved in the fight with the Amalekites. And David had his 600 men who were speaking of stoning him after they had lost their wives and children at the hands of the Amalekites. And David recovered all. And now while all this is happening, the battle is preparing between Israel and the Philistines. 
And in this battle, the king of Israel is slain. Saul was a massive man. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, the warrior tribe of Israel. Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand, the name means. The warrior fighting tribe. Saul was head and shoulders, easily recognizable, head and shoulders above others. And the Bible says when the battle was ended, the nightfall came and when the dawn broke, the Philistines came back to the battlefield to rob the slain, to strip the slain. It was a practice, no doubt, because you didn't get paid for being in this army, that when the battle was over and the enemy soldiers had been slain, it was your right to steal anything you could steal of value and take from these dead bodies. And so as they were walking carelessly, no doubt, through the battlefield, just kicking over bodies and making sure everybody was dead. They weren't putting them to death. They came to this massive man and they recognized he was different from others. And they turned over his body to find this was the king of Israel, the leader of the army, dead. As they searched, they found the bodies of his sons. And so, to add insult to all they'd done, they cut off his head, carried it like a trophy, published it all through the Philistine areas that Israel had lost to the Philistines. The king was dead. His sons were dead with him. And they carried his bodies, lifeless bodies, to a visible place and nailed them for all to come and spectate against the wall in Bethshan. Well, the news reached Israel and those who were left from the battle. And the word of God says that a certain group, if you'll read it again, please, in verse 11, when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. Now God doesn't tell us all the peril these valiant men went through, but we can just imagine how dangerous a task this was, how much energy it took to travel all night to make their way to the wall of Bethshan to find the place of spectacle where the king's body and his son's bodies were on display to fight their way through, no doubt, retrieve the bodies and bring them back out of respect and love and reverence as the people of God and to give a proper burial to these king and three sons. Why did they do it? Why did they do it? Why did the valiant men arise? I'm trying to give you just a little bit of a motive, if you can catch it, for why we need to arise. They were rising up while a battlefield was filled with bodies of defeated soldiers while a nation had suffered great peril, while the king was dead, the princes were dead, there was great sorrow in the land. But somehow or another, they found what they needed within them to rise up, to face the peril, and to travel all night to Bethshan and bring the bodies back for burial. I want you to hold your place here just for a moment. I want to give you just a little episode. If you open your Bible back to the book of 1 Samuel, and I want you to see this in the word of God about what God says about the peril that these men had faced, what they'd gone through, how they had witnessed something in their heritage that aroused their hearts and brought about this 
risky task of rising up as valiant men and retrieving the body of the king and his sons. I want you to follow me through the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Samuel as we begin with verse one. This historical record is given to us to connect with the valiant men of Jabez Gilead about why they did what they did. And the Bible says, then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, give us seven days respite that we might send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voice and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field and Saul said, what aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and set them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. And they said unto the messengers that came, thus shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by that time the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will come out unto you and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, who is he that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, there shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Then said Samuel to the people, come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Now that episode precedes, of course, the episode you find in 1 Samuel with the death of Saul. And the men of Jabesh Gilead got the news that Saul, their savior, Saul, the man who spared them, perhaps these were the children of those men who were spared. When the news came to Jabesh Gilead that every man would have his eye plucked out. Think of that, your right eye. You'll go the rest of your life without your right eye as reproach to Israel to say that our gods are stronger than your God. That we have greater might than you have. And helplessly there they were till Saul rallied an army and came and saved them. Now, 
when the Philistines had done their worst, Saul and his sons were dead. The slain had been stripped. They'd taken all of their bounty back and they reached the wall of Bashan and hung the headless bodies of the king and his sons on the wall. When that news reached the men of Jabesh Gilead, they remembered something. They remembered what this man had done for them. They remembered how they'd been hopeless in their peril till God used this man to intervene. They remembered their heritage and they rose up to do something with valiant behavior that other people would not do. And what I'm saying to you, we need to see the valiant men arise, break from the normal, step out of the crowd, go beyond what is normally done and go into the peril that God's given us, face what we must face and get God's work done in our time, but why? Why? Because we don't want the reproach brought to our God and we remember our heritage. We remember who we are. May God help us. Do you, do you know who you are as a child of God? Do you know the heritage that's been handed to you? I remember listening to a speech given by Winston Churchill. He gave it in America. It was a speech in which he used the term the great iron curtain is falling across Europe. And he said to the audience listening to him in Missouri, he said, they said they would take us and wring our necks like a chicken. And then he shouted, some chicken? Do they not know who we are? Some chicken? Do they not know who we are? And you know the devil marches, the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's an army against God. Somebody showed me pictures today of Dearborn, Michigan. It used to be the ideal community for business booming in all of America. And the pictures of it today look like something from another world filled with strange gods to America. I'm just saying to you, how long will we sit while the slain and the dead and the bodies of the dead hang on the walls of the world and they rejoice about the weakness, the weakness of churches and the weakness of Christians? It's time, past time, it's time now for valiant men to arise and do what God's given us to do. You say, well, not everybody will get up and go. They won't. But will you? Will you go beyond the average? Say, I'm not just happy with being a part of it. I'm gonna step out front, run the risk. I'm gonna do what I can while I can. Find a motive. Is it your children? Is it your future? Is it your past? Find a motive. These men had a motive because they were grateful for how God had delivered them and they knew exactly who God had used to deliver them. While we sit and enjoy all the wonderful things that God has blessed us with, do you ever think about the people who paid a great price even to their own lives so that we could have all of this to enjoy? It's time all the valiant men arise. And if they don't arise, all the devil's gonna do is walk through where the dead are lying and strip the slain, take anything they want, and more sons and more daughters and more families wrecked and ruined, more lives lost, more people giving their life to the devil and to every kind of drugs and everything else imaginable till Christian people arise and remember what God has done for us and be the champions God wants us to be. We need to arise. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to define it for you. I really don't know how to define it to you. The first time my wife and I went to Israel together, and we've been 16 times, we went to Masada. 
Masada is, is a symbol to the Jewish people. If you know anything about the history of Masada, this rock plateau where a fortress had been built is where Israelites fortified themselves atop this fortress that Herod had created to fight against Rome and the Roman army when Jerusalem had fallen. And to everyone's surprise, they held out longer than anyone could ever imagine till it became a place to represent all of Israel while Rome was attacking it. And so finally, the Romans built a ramp up to the top of Masada and they used slave labor from the Jews to build it. And as the Jewish rebels on top who were holding out against Rome kept trying to put to death those who were building, they realized they were killing their own people. And they knew after a while there was no end to it. And the Romans would finally reach the top. Perhaps you know the story well enough to know the names of the people who chose lots and who was appointed to slay others and then finally slay themselves so that the Romans found nothing when they came. They made sure that all their supplies were not touched so that they would say to the enemy, we want you to know we didn't starve to death. We didn't die of hunger and we didn't die of thirst. It was our choice not to surrender to you. And when they came, finally the Romans came and found their bodies, then the story spread. And that episode of Israel's history became a part of emboldening Israel against all enemies. Now, perhaps I need to explain more of it, but I'm going to stop there. I was on top of that mountain when a group of young Israeli soldiers ran up. We took cable cars up. Young men and young women they look like teenagers. I found out later, of course, that every 18-year-old man and woman becomes a part of the Israeli army to defend Israel against their enemies. And when they came to the top, someone told me later that it was a swearing-in ceremony after their training. They were all now part of the military. And they lined up across that rocky plateau, leveled, where once those holdouts from the fall of Jerusalem and the slaughter of Rome had been fought against for those years holding out. And they lined up, those young soldiers. And when they got all in place, they held their rifles above their heads and they shouted in one accord, Israel shall never fall again. In other words, they took that episode of Masada and said, now we're just 18-year-olds, but it's our moment to defend our nation. Somehow they got it. And if you know anything about their history, if you know anything about their fighting force, kids grow up from little children knowing when they get to a certain age, that's it. They enlist. They fight the enemy. They may be in a bloody war. They may be just in some sort of missile attack. But whatever they're facing, whatever the enemy is doing, and whoever the enemy may be, it's their time to defend their nation. And you know what we do in this country, Christian people? We get bored. We hop from church to church. We want somebody to do something else to excite us. But there needs to be a generation, even of young men and women, who say, we're taking our stand. This is our moment. We've arrived. It's our time for the battle now. We're enlisted. We're God's children. And we're not gonna suffer any longer just to be run over and pushed around 
by the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are now going to be the soldiers of the cross that God's called us to be. Somehow, somewhere, sometime, in that group of men from Jabez Gilead, someone, I don't know who, but no doubt someone said, let's go. Let's go. Let's travel the distance. Let's leave now. Let's rescue the bodies of our king and his sons. Somebody lit a match, figuratively, metaphorically, started a fire, and the rest joined in, and they followed. I'm saying to you, I don't know how many times God will give us an opportunity to start or to do this. Only he knows what the future holds. But it is our time for the valiant to arise and do the work of God. And I want to call on you in God's name to find whatever it takes for what the Lord has done for you to take your place among the valiant, to rise up and let's do what God's given us to do. Let's bow in prayer, may we?